So welcome everyone to our very first Foresight Talks webinar of 2021. Uh, my name is Aicha Gurayev and I am the program manager for uh, IFTF Foresight Essentials, um, which is the branch of the Institute that aims to teach people how to think like a futurist and how to practice for strategic foresight. We're really excited to discuss Indigenous futures today with both Jason Edward Lewis and IFTF's Executive Director, Marina Gorbis. Before I hand it off to Marina to introduce uh, Jason and get the conversation started, I'll spend just a few minutes um, explaining the mission behind this webinar and what the uh, Foresight Essentials program is doing. Um, for those who are just joining um, a Foresight Talk for the first time, our mission with this webinar series is to grow the foresight capabilities of our diverse global community through deep enhanced connections, mutual learning, and better awareness of our community's needs. It's a series of conversations with master foresight practitioners who offer advice, insight, and food for thought to our global foresight community. Our agenda for today is a short welcome, which I'm doing now, then the conversation between Jason and Marina, uh, followed by a large chunk of the hour where we will take questions from all of you here today. Um, as I mentioned, Foresight Essentials is the educational branch of IFTF. So we have a number of offerings for individuals, teams, and communities who want to implement strategic foresight, navigate large scale change, and lead toward a vibrant future. You can learn more about Foresight Essentials at the link that um, I am putting into the chat right now. Um, and specifically for individuals, we have our flagship training for learning foresight, the amazing design futures training, futures thinking on Coursera, and we have a brand new course, IFTF scenario building, which I'll say more about in a second. Um, we also have trainings meant to be taken with your team, including a leadership class taught by a distinguished fellow Dr. Bob Johansson, and these are customized for your own group's needs. Finally, we have several free resources for our community, including this webinar series. And um, the Ask a Futures webinar is where you can get to meet IFTF staff and ask them your questions. We actually have one next week uh, about optimistic futures with IFTF research fellow Jacques Barcia. And um, our certified practitioner meetups are monthly meetings exclusive to IFTF alumni. And our monthly Foresight Essentials newsletter shares tips, practical insight, and events related to futures thinking. Uh, please check out all of this stuff and more on our homepage, iftf.org. Um, so as I mentioned, we have a brand new course, IFTF Scenario Building, and our first one is coming this March. Um, so building scenarios is a very important piece of futures thinking. So we're super excited about this offering. Um, this class is also special because we'll use our own post COVID scenarios as our template. So you'll be immersed in that content. You can find more about the training at the link that I'm putting into the chat right now. Um, and if you're just interested in learning about our post COVID scenarios, you can check those out. Uh, they're available um, and you can see them on our, at the link that I'm adding to in the chat right now. So final slide before I hand it over to Marina, I'm sure most of you are already familiar with Zoom or a similar video conferencing service thanks to our COVID lockdowns. But just a reminder to make sure you've selected all panelists and attendees um, so that everyone can see your comments in the chat um, secondly, please ask questions using the Q&A feature, not chat, so we don't miss any of your questions. And also, um, also so you can upvote other people's questions or people can upvote your questions. And, um, and you're welcome to add questions in the Q&A um, at any time. Um, and thirdly, everyone is automatically muted and your videos um, have been turned off. Finally, this webinar is being recorded and will be made available on our site within the next within the next week. Um, let me just share the link to our Foresight Talk site, or you can find all of our archived episodes as well. 
So without further delay, I'm going to turn it over uh, to IFTF's very own Executive Director, Marina Gorbis, and our guest, Jason Edward Lewis. Hello. Can you hear me, I too? Yes. OK, great. Thank you so much for the introduction. Um, I am, I have to say, I'm thrilled to be in the conversation with Jason Edward Lewis. Um, I wasn't familiar with his work until recently, until my colleague uh, Lynn Jeffrey found <laughs> Jason. And um, since that, in the preparation for this event, I've been reading and digging into his work. And I have to say, I was just blown away. And I hope that this is a start of a much longer conversation. Um, as you probably have seen, Jason is a professor of design and computation at Concordia University in Canada. He's a remarkable individual. Uh, I think the breadth of his work and expertise, he's an artist, he's a poet, he's a writer, he's a software designer. He's, um, uh, he founded the Initiative for Indigenous Futures at Concordia and has put together a workshop on indigenous um, um, practices, principles for AI, and is just doing really, I, I think, kind of mind-blowing work. And to me, he's like the best example of a futurist because you have to be Im immersed in different worlds to be able to, to do this kind of work and think creatively, but at the same time, be able to understand technology and work with data and connect all these pieces into one. So I'm just going to dig into the conversation and maybe Jason, let's start with you. How Tell us a, a little bit about your journey. How did you go from where you started to where you are now and connect all these dots of your uh, background? Okay, well, first I want to say thank you uh, to um, uh, you, you and Aicha for, for inviting me and and hosting me for this conversation. And I wanna thank you to the audience for lending lending us your their ears for the next hour or so. Um, so yeah, the super, super quick story. Um, so I'm Hawaiian and Samoan, uh, but I was adopted out at a very, very young age and uh, grew up in uh, Northern California, actually up in the hills in a town of 350 people. Um, and um, I think that, uh, um, that's kind of had a profound effect on me in several different ways. And, and one of them is sort of thinking a lot about community, but also thinking about the fact that, you know, I was like one of only three brown people uh, amongst those uh, 350 people. Uh, but I had a fantastic upbringing. I, I, I loved where I grew up. I loved the people I grew up with. And I'm very grateful for, uh, for all of that. Um, so I, I studied essentially computer science at uh, Stanford as one of my degrees. Um, my actual degree is in symbolic systems, which is a computer science core with some other things uh, uh, arrayed around it. Uh, and then uh, philosophy via German studies degree uh, as an undergraduate. Um, and um, my, my core interest was and always has been thinking about how our use of digital technology affects the ways that we communicate with each other. Um, and uh, um, I, I went off into the Valley after that, worked for um, a couple of research labs, and then um, was actually challenged by one of my mentors, Brenda Laurel, who said, okay, you know, you're, 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 you know, you're spending a lot of time critiquing how other people are doing interface design. Why don't you see if you can design, if you can design them yourself? And so uh, with her support and the sponsorship of Interval Research, which is where I was working, I went to do my graduate work at the Royal College of Art in London, uh, which at the time, uh, the, the computer related design program at the RCA and the media lab, MIT Media Lab, were kind of the only two places you could go and sort of combine kind of technology and, and creative practice in some way. So, um, and then I returned back to the Valley after that, uh, after I became a designer and an artist. And so um, I spent a lot of time in Silicon Valley research labs working with kind of intensely multidisciplinary teams, you know, so anthropologists, physicists, linguists, uh, electrical engineers, um, 
uh, visual artist, etc. Um, I feel very extremely fortunate about that because I think I learned as a young professional to the value of looking at things from within different frameworks, right? So that you kind of, you know, can sit down and watch five minutes of video of people interacting with say a piece of software. Um, and then uh, you can spend five hours with a, you know, with a linguist and a sociologist and an electrical engineer you know, sort of all of you talking about the different ways you see what's happening there. Which is um, really a part of the future's practice. We always say that you need to bring many different voices into the conversation when yeah. you're looking at something. Yeah, and I think that part of the really key part of that education was um, sort of seeing how they, how they translated for each other, seeing how they were able to kind of mobilize sort of common objects of research that they could then use to sort of illuminate for each other sort of how they saw what was going on in that object. Um, and also just some simple things like, you know, to be caring and to be kind and to, you know, to be respectful of other people, um, you know, even if you can't necessarily quite understand their point of view. Um, and then uh, fast forward, uh, moved to Montreal because I fell in love with a beautiful woman from Montreal and um, found myself without a job happily for about a year. And then I was like, oh, maybe I should get a job. And um, it just happens that the Concordia University was starting up this program, which is now called Computation Arts. And they were looking for people who had both uh, creative practice and technical practice um, to teach in the course. And because it was brand new, because there weren't many of us around at that time, uh, they, and they gave me the job, despite the fact that uh, even though the opening slide the opening two slides say that I have a doctorate. I don't have a doctorate. I have an MPhil from the Royal College of Art. Um, and, uh, you know, started building this program. So that's also a really key point is that myself, along with my colleague, Joanna, uh, colleague Joanna Brzezowska, who's hired at the same time, you know, we were given the task of really building this program out and making this combination of like, okay, so, you know, we have undergraduates. How do we actually kind of create an education for them where they get a really solid uh, 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 sort of computational foundation, uh, both software and hardware, uh, but also we really, you know, sort of give them, we sort of form them into creative practitioners. And then just because that wasn't as challenging enough, you know, how do we do that from a critical cultural perspective? So they're also taught to think, you know, critically about their practice. Um, and then about that same time too, I became, uh, active and you know the conversations I was having with my wife who is a uh, Mohawk from Ganawage which is just outside of Montreal uh, who is a, a you know uh, an internet pioneer she founded Cyber Pow Wow which was the first online gallery for exhibiting indigenous art uh, anywhere first show was in 1996 um, and she invited me into that for the third iteration and so we started, a, you know, what is now a 20 year long conversation about what, it, what does it mean for, to be indigenous in virtual environments? What does it mean to be indigenous and use these tools? What does it mean to be an indigenous artist? You know, if your art isn't based on traditional indi indigenous crafts, right? And materials, which was a really, you know, you know, there, there, there were people you know, indigenous people and non-indigenous people at the time were like, well, you're not really an indigenous artist if you're like working with digital technology, that's a white man's tool, right? Mm -hmm. You know, so, um, you know, and since then we've done a number of, of things together, Aboriginal Territories and Cyberspace, which we started in 2004, which uh, started working with indigenous communities to think through how they could use different kinds of digital technology to tell the stories that they wanna tell. Um, and then in 2014, we started the Initiative for Indigenous Futures with a bunch of partners, which is sort of continuing similar sort of critiques, but really kind of creating that future framing, you know, in response to what we felt was um, a, a, um, not a lot of space within the Indigenous community to, to sort of talk and think and dream about the future, uh, because there's you know, lots of challenges in the present. Um, and most of the conversation about what it means to be indigenous is, is a lot of it's around sort of like kind of recovering and honoring sort of, you know, the things that have happened in the past. Yeah. I and wanted so, to ask you about that. It, yeah. it, it sounds like 
a lot of your interest in the futures is connecting indigenous cultures and technology and futures of technology and bringing that. But you're also involved in conservation and archiving sort of traditional art artifacts. So how, how do you think about that, like the past and the future? Well, so I think, you know, from the really short bio that I, I sketched out for you, you know, my my grounding in my culture is still relatively new, you know, so I wasn't grounded in it when I was growing up. Um, and uh, I spent a fair amount of time when I was at university involved with the, with the American Indian community there. But it really wasn't until, you know, in the last 10 years that I've been spending a lot of time, for instance, in Hawaii. And so I'm learning. I'm very much at the beginning of a very, you know, kind of expansive learning path. So, um, but one of the things that I understand from that, but also all the different communities that we've worked with and the people that I've studied with, you know, is, is really to reconceptualize how I think about the future. Um, that, uh, you know, one of the banes of, I would say our Western world is this, this, this arrow of time idea that we're always like progressing and the people in the past were, you know, more primitive and kind of less human than we are. And we're going towards sort of ever more enlightenment. Um, and, you know, none of the indigenous philosophies that I'm familiar with look at time that way. They look at time as a circle. They look at time as a, sp as a spiral. They look at time as, as just a, just like all of space time is just existing right now. It's just a question of how you get from where you're at now to where and when, you know, you want to be. And so, for me, um, it's really, and all of the cultures, particularly Hawaiian culture, you know, it's, there's no, there is no future without the past, you know, particularly in North America, you know, it's not, it's not, you know, when I found, when I would lived in, in London and lived in Berlin, and I don't think it was as, as strong, but certainly in North America, you know, there's just such a drive to forget the past, right? The whole, you know, the part of the whole founding myth of both these countries is you could come here and forget what you, you know, what you left behind. And it's just, an, it's just kind of, you know, insinuated it into kind of every nook and cranny of how we think about things. And the indigenous groups that we work with, you know, are like, that is a really kind of unhealthy way to live. Um, like it's, it's, first of all, it's, um, it's delusional, right? We're, we're products of the history that brought us to this point. Um, and in that delusion, there's a lot of violence, that, that gets done to, and I mean, actual physical violence to people, not just epistemic violence. Um, and that it's, you know, it's much more productive to living well with your community and with your territory if you keep in mind what you've learned in the past, right? What your elders and what your ancestors learned about how to live well in that context, if you bring that with you. So that's always, you know, as we've been developing the future imaginary and the way that we talk about this stuff, that's something that I think keeps us really grounded um, where we're excited. And when I say we, I'm, I, I, a lot of times I have in my head, my wife, uh, Scott Wanati, who she actually just walked in the room over there. So that's also why I'm thinking about her. Um, <laughs> but uh, we love science fiction. We love science fiction. And I'm a, I'm a, I'm a technology freak. I love technology, digital technology. I love programming. Um, and so it's like, how do we, how do we use what we can learn about the world from those practices in a way that's useful for our communities, right? Or useful to us as indigenous artists or practitioners and with, for other indigenous people, you know, how do we, um, how do we illuminate the relevance, you know, um, uh, imagine the ways the technology can be used that's that's productive for us because also most colonized people you know they've been at the pointy end of the of the technology stick right so the technology has been used to kill us to capture us to confine us to misre misrepresent us and so there's lots of skepticism you know in the communities that we work with about like kind of wholeheartedly embracing some of these technologies because of how they've been used against us in the past. And so part of what we, 
Yeah. Yeah. Go ahead. Can I can I ask you a question about uh, obviously the conception of time is really important, right? Yeah. Uh, and connecting the past and the future, we always say that you can't think about the future without really understanding the past. But it seems like, uh, and you know, the pandemic and what we're going through now in terms of our political situation here, we're so good about forgetting the past. It's it's just like we go through yeah. the cycle. Something happens, we we bring it back. Is there a different way? How do you keep the past present so it's not something that you have to dig up and you know rediscover? Is there something? <laughs> that's a big question. I mean, you know, what I see, what I see that that seems to work is uh, so first of all that you um, you know you honor and you stay active with your elders. <laughs> you don't stick them off in old folks homes and forget about them or, you know, uh, you know, move across the country and forget about them. And like, you keep them active in your lives so that they can, they can tell the stories and not just the cultural stories, but I mean, just the stories of their life, you know, what life was like, you know, for them and what they lived through and then what their grandparents lived through because their grandparents told them stories. And so you create this sense, both you, 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 personalize it right because i think that's also one of the issues with the way history is taught in kind of most of our schools it's not personal like it's it's hard for students to see the connection between themselves and what that history is um but you also reinforce this idea of like kind of long kind of deep time and continuity right that you that you know i'm here you know my son is here because I'm here and the story of why I'm here is a weird story when you think about it, you know, and then maybe the story of my parents is like, everybody's story is weird in some way. Which is very different than how we live and the whole concept of nuclear family and you're yeah. right, putting yeah, yeah. older people into nursing homes and we're seeing now some impacts of that with COVID. Yeah, um, you know. It, it's continuing the, the narrative and connecting the narrative from generation to generation. Right. And, and capitalism has personal. capitalism has an investment for cutting you off from that narrative, and atomizing us, yeah. right? Um, yeah. And um, and and convincing us that all we have to rely on is is you know, like ourselves and like the four people immediately around us because right. it makes us vulnerable. Yeah, kind of connected to that. The you know I was reading your making kin with machines, which by the way I highly recommend for everybody to read. And it sort of, to me, connected with some of the conversations we've been having. Aicha mentioned that we've developed these scenarios for the future, uh, post-pandemic future. And one of the scenarios, we use alternative scenarios methodology, which has these archetypes. One of the archetypes is transformation. And transformation right. is much harder for people. It's the hardest thing for people to think about because we're so wedded to our belief systems and our worldview of today or the last 50 years, we, and it's very hard to imagine something very different, with different ideology, different set of belief systems. Mm -hmm. And reading your um, Making Kin with Machines, um, I realized, and I guess I knew it, but you pointed it out, a very different epistemology of indigenous knowledge, right? Like mm -hmm. different set of beliefs, which is a, a so, needed like right now and i wonder if you can sort of talk about that like the the fact that human is not the center of the universe you know that we're all connected and we're all in mutual relationship in mutuality and interdependence which you know is another thing that's become so clear with the pandemic right. but can you talk about that set of beliefs and how it shapes kind of how you think I, I can talk about it, but I'm going to talk about it with a couple uh, sort of caveats at the top, right? So one of those caveats is that, uh, as I already said, like, I'm not here to talk on behalf of all Hawaiians or all right. Samoans. Um, I'm here to talk about the work that we do and the way that I think about things. Um, and, uh, and that there are many, many, many different kinds of, of indigenous thought. And so one of the things that we really tried to do with the Making Kin with, machine, with the Machines uh, essay is really highlight and say, look, okay, we're gonna, part of this we're gonna talk about at the level of indigenous, right? So we're gonna talk about sort of some of the things that can, what we see is connecting our different peoples. Um, and, uh, but we're also gonna be very specific, when, when we get down to the specifics of how might we actually approach machines as kin, 
we're actually going to uh, talk from specific cultural foundations. So uh, there's Noe Arista, who's talking about it from a Hawaiian perspective. She's a professor of history in Hawaii at University of Hawaii. There's Archer Pachawis, who is a media artist based in Toronto. He is Cree. Um, and he's been theorizing about Indigenous media since the 80s. Uh, and uh, uh, Suzanne Kite, who is uh, working with me as my PhD student, uh, and she's Lakota, she's a performance artist. So she was talking from a Lakota perspective. And we really wanted to do that to emphasize like, okay, you know, to we can have an interesting conversation at that Indigenous level, but when we actually get down to thinking about how to implement things, it really needs to be done from a particular cultural uh, framework. So I'll talk about the the general, you know, the the sort of general stuff. So one of the things that we found in our experience and our research and so forth, right, is this, you know, this kind of bedrock of relationality is that, you know, you, there's, there is no speaking about the individual without speaking about the web of relationships that the person is, uh, is enmeshed in. And that we are dependent we are so dependent upon so many different things. And, you know, some of those things are human, but some of those things are non-human, right? And some of those things are from a Western standpoint, not even living, right? So, you know, rivers or mountains or stones. And, you know, you can, you know, everybody can figure out and different communities can figure out sort of where they want to kind of place animacy and agency and stuff like that. That's not, that's not really the big point. The big point is, as part of, this language and this thinking about everything in terms of relation and extending kinship to things that are other than human is to remind yourself of your interdependency, right? That, um, you know, we, again, in a Western, particularly North American framework, you know, we're taught to think about ourselves as the individual, you know, the Cartesian ego that's like, you know, kind of independent and able to affect the world completely through act of will. And that's bullshit, right? Sorry. Um, you know, it's a horrible kind of delusion that has been a hold of Western culture for a very long time. Um, but it's, you know, that's, that's really clear as we were talking about before the, before we started, you know, the pandemic, you know, is just a really another example of how interdependent we are on each other and, you know, how we need to spend time thinking about how to tend to those interdependencies. Um, so that's, you know, that's a really big kind of bedrock, I think, of, of, of the indigenous cultures with which I'm familiar. So it's um, connectedness and interrelationships and connecting everything that we're- Yeah, and so, of. right. And so part of the reason we also talk about protocol is that protocol is one of the ways that we remind ourselves of those relationships, right? So ceremony, you know, there can be like formal ceremony, there can be informal ceremony, there can be protocol just about how you, you know, how you treat your elders or how you treat your kids or how you, how you treat guests or visitors. Like uh, for me, this is my interpretation, right? Part of what is happening there is these are tools that have been developed over very long periods of time that help remind us of our responsibilities to other people, right? They're, they're not just ceremony, right? They're not just incantation. Um, and they're not about say, you know, in the, in the Christian environment, you know, most of that is oriented to you having a relationship with some supreme being, right? Um, and it's not about that, right? It's about, these, you know, these relationships that are in front of us. And for, you know, again, lots of indigenous people I know, what's in front of them are things that from a Western context often get described and dismissed as spirits, right? Um, and it's much more complicated and rich than that. You know, um, part of the West, part of what happens in the Western discourse is this really persistent cleaving apart of uh, sort of like kind of empirical, you know, stuff you can touch materially um, from things that we experience emotionally, spiritually, et cetera. And like this, this whole thing of like, these things don't belong together, right? Um, and that's also bullshit, right? That's also not actually how people operate in the world, right? Um, it's people operate in response to their emotions, in response to their desires to, you know, 
have transcendence of some sort, you know, in response to, um, you know, needs to connect with, with other people. And those things are real. Like those are actually the things that motivate us. <laughs> uh, so do you think, I'm just wondering, um, how do you think about, or is that something that you, kind of beyond what your, your interest is, how do you think about, how do you displace dominant beliefs, right? And move to, or, or is that something which has to do with power and all kinds of other things, but is, yeah. is that not uh, something? Well, this is, this is what, so I'll, I'll talk about what we do, right? Which isn't about like changing governments, right? Um, <laughs> Uh, you know, so the way that we go about that, for instance, with our, we run a series of workshops called the Skins Workshops on Aboriginal storytelling and digital media. And the big ones that we do there are these three week long intensive workshops on video games. And so just really quickly, the first week, whatever community we're working with, um, we've worked a lot with the Mohawk community here in Montreal, and then also the Hawaiian community in Honolulu, we spend the first week telling stories. Right, so the participants bring in stories from their from their family. Um, we invite in respected storytellers and elders to tell stories from the community, um, and uh, and then the second week we we give them a crash course on all the tools you you need to know in order to make a game, and why they're doing that. They're we're also working with them to take that first week and think about a story that they want to tell in the game. And then the third week we make a game, we, we, we produce a game with them. They build a game and we produce it. And for, for me, the way I look at it is that whole thing is about overturning dominant frames of knowledge, right? So many of these participants, they're young, you know, they're usually in like late teens, early twenties, they're indigenous, you know, they've been told all their lives, for instance, that indigenous knowledge is worthless. Right, the Hawaiians are just are just superstitious, right? Um, and uh, the knowledge that they that comes from that tradition isn't going to help them in the 21st century. Um, they've also been told that you know American occupation is the natural way for things to be. That of course they're part of America and they'll always be part of America, right? So there's all these kind of dominant ideologies that they've been absorbing, you know, since they were young, even if they've grown up in a traditional family because they're still in Hawaii. Um, and so part of our, a big part of what we're doing is we're like, okay, so first of all, you know, there's been indigenous technological innovation since time immemorial, right? Here's some of those things. So you're doing some debunking the myths. Yeah, well. yeah, you know, second of all, you know, your culture knows a lot. And in particular, your culture knows a lot about living here. And it knows more, in fact, it knows more about living here than the dominant Western culture. Right. So they're getting these messages from other places. Too. We're not the only people doing this, but it's just sort of focused and, and concentrated. And you can use these technologies to tell Hawaiian stories or to tell Mohawk stories. There's nothing mutually exclusive about these things. Right. So we try to kind of reprogram knowledge frameworks at that ground level of like working, and this is one of the reasons why we do the workshops, right? It's not just to teach them how to make video games, right? It's to be like, okay, this is our way of decolonizing people's thought, right? There's lots of other ways it can be done, but this is our way to do it. Um, and I think that's what has to happen, you know, is that it happens has to happen on the ground in lots of different small communities. Um, and it has to be focused and intense and, and, and a, and a um, what's the word I'm looking for? A sustained set of innovations. One class isn't going to do it, right? One person coming in and lecturing is not going to do it. Um, and it yeah. has to be done in a way that the community, you know, agrees and support it, right? So we're always we we are invited in, right? Um, a, so are you? Um, so how do you decolonize Silicon Valley and the tech thinking? Is, is, is that a possibility? It's got to be. It's got to be because if we don't do it, they're going to drive us to ruin. Um, uh, so about when it? I think and about you, decolonization, you in Silicon Valley. So yeah. Know the... So you know, I think about these things in two ways. So there's a representational issue, which is a very important and real issue, which is like who's at the table, right? Lots of people talk about this. 
Um, and I do think it makes, um, you know, I do think it makes a difference, um, you know, but, you know, as we see, you know, brown people, women can get into power and be captured by the system, right? Um, and not actually be able to change the system or they lose the desire to change the system. So representation by itself isn't enough. You know, and I think it's funny too, you know, you know, Twitter a couple months back, they had this problem where they created this image cropping algorithm that like favored white people over black people and stuff like that. You know who they're, you know, their chief of design is a black guy. Okay, so the representational thing is not going to solve it on its own. It still has to happen because that also involves issues of equity and opportunity and things like that. But for me, there's the epistemological fight, right? Which is who's who gets to decide the assumptions? Who gets to decide what is important? Who gets to decide which communities are important? Right? These are epistemological questions that have to be worked at at that level of you have to change who you're designing technology for and why you're designing technology. I mean, Silicon Valley has been in a friggin' rut for the last, what, you know, ever since social media kind of matured and the app ecosystem kind of matured that everybody's just been churning out the same thing again and again. Right. So, you know, part of the thing that I say is like, you guys should be desperately looking for different ways of thinking about the world because you're just caught in this horrible loop of regurgitating the same kind of basic set of ideas again and again, and no machine learning is not gonna save you, right? Which is seems to be the current sentiment. Um, just add machine learning and it's gonna be magic, just the way that we added mobile, you know, 10 years ago when it became magic. Um, and, uh, you know, and part of the reason why machine learning is not gonna save you is because machine lear learning is epistemologically unsound, right? So if you are, I mean, the more I think about it and talk about it, the more I just find it ridiculous that we've gotten to this point. If your model, both research and industry, is based on sucking in, you know, millions, hundreds of millions, billions of data points without checking them, then you have a problematic model, mm -hmm. right? You are building things based on faulty knowledge and you're mistaking the map for the territory. Like you're hoovering up all this data from the web and taking that as a representation right. of how people live, right. right? You're taking it as data in the same way that, you know, a physicist takes Newton's second law as data, right? But, but it, it's not true. And it's astounding to me that we've gotten this far along where we've allowed both the research people and the industry people, because the research people try to squirm away and say, well, we're not responsible for how it's used, but that is disingenuous. Right. I, but I think you put your finger on it. It's the question of who gets to decide what's yeah. important. That's and who gets to and a lot of times here, who gets to decide is who gets the money to decide. Yeah, oh yeah, right? absolutely. So yeah. it's it's a whole kind of infrastructure that yeah. drives certain outcomes. Yeah. And the, I mean, you know, you think Silicon Valley as a whole is like homogenous, like the VC world is obscenely homogenous. Right. You know, and it's the same group of people that just keep like getting the, you know, making the big bucks and then feeding it to people that look like them. Um, so, yeah, the who ultimately the way I talk about it is like who, who, like you said, who gets to decide where does who gets to say no? Yeah, that's the important thing. Not even that's even more important than who gets to say yes. Oh, who gets to say no? Right? Who gets to say no? Who gets yeah. to put a stop to this? Uh -huh. Right. Is really, really important. Um, By the way, I see in the chat, people are really interested in resources and people you've mentioned. So I know there are many. And why don't we just say that we're going to send people, all the participants, can we put together a list of sources where people want to know more about it? Yep. Um, one thing I wanted to ask you is um, where do you see, so there's what you're doing, where are these pockets of basically alternative beliefs and knowledge that are driving this? So, um, you know, one of the, uh, so I'll, I'll just talk about the Indigenous Protocol and AI workshops yeah. for the audience so that they have a little bit of context. Uh, so um, uh, at the same time that we were uh, writing, my co-authors and I were writing the Making Kin with the Machines essay, 
uh, I was working with another set of Indigenous folks to put together what uh, became known as an Indigenous Protocol and AI workshops. And, um, and for me, those workshops do, grew directly out of the thinking that I was doing my collaborators on that essay, which is like, you know, how can we think really differently about artificial intelligence? Um, and so we did two workshops in 2019, um, uh, where we brought, the first one we brought 35 indigenous, 30, 35 participants, 30 of them indigenous from across North America, the Pacific, Australia, and New Zealand to talk about, um, you know, indigenous epistemology, indigenous protocol, indigenous ways of being, and knowing about the world in relationship to artificial intelligence. Um, and so, uh, and we produce a position paper, we'll drop the link in and stuff like that, and encourage people to go see it. And now I've forgotten what your question was that I felt like I had to set that up. What was your question? And I forgot it myself. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> oh, where, where are, where are other places? Right. So, country? you know, there's really great work that Maori are doing different Iwis, different, uh, you know, different, um, you know, kind of clans or extended family groups um, uh, in the Maori community. They've been on top of the data sovereignty question for, for years now, even maybe decades. Um, been really clear about the need to, to own the data that's extracted from them and, and to determine how that data is used, you know, partic both particularly around health and around uh, territory. Um, and there's some really great, we can send the links, there's some great groups there, the, you know, the people uh, who were part of the indigenous protocol group, uh, Peter Lucas Jones um, and uh, Caleb Moses uh, working down there on kind of uh, sort of the data stuff, but also on uh, machine language, like language translation projects. Um, Michael Running Wolf, who was one of the participants in the workshop, he just started a group called Indigenous in AI uh, that um, debuted at NeurIPS, the big uh, machine learning conference about a month ago, I guess, a month and a half ago. Um, and so he's pulling together a really interesting group of people who are professionals who work in uh, machine learning, you know, to have these sorts of conversations. You know, I think the work that, um, you know, um, uh, in some ways that, you know, Timnit, Gebru, and uh, Joy, you know, Bula Wani, the work that they've been doing kind of being critical about sort of AI. I mean, you know, I, I, most of that's, I think, focused on sort of like, how do we make this industry be better? Um, and how do we make the technology better? But I also, but also in that, I think, are arguments about different, like fundamentally different frameworks. Um, and uh, and then there's you know there's all you know most of the people who are in the working group they're doing work in one way or another, and so they're all listed on our website and they're in the position paper and you can go and see you can go check out the work that they do um, that's you know trying to push back against these yeah. dominant frameworks for thinking about how uh, you know how technology is is built right now. Right. It sounds to me like we need to kind of put together a whole syllabus and of people, papers, places where this kind of work is is happening. I see. Yeah. yeah, yeah, no, that would be great. That would be great. I have a, I teach a seminar, graduate seminar this semester called the Future Imaginary. Um, and so I have some of that in that syllabus, but that's, but that's not focused on the AI thing um, and the technology thing. Uh, but uh, no, that would be that'd be fantastic. I'd love to do that course. Let's commit to doing that. Great. I think people are really interested in kind of you explaining more about the concept of time. I think you kind of did it um, and how it, I, I don't know, I, I guess my question to you would be, given that the kind of the futures field, the Western futures field came from a very different set of beliefs and no, uh, ideas and is there an intersection? What do you see and how do the two connect? Um, oh, I think, I personally think there's lots of intersections. Yeah. Right. I, I think that, you know, in the same way that we live in both a, a Newtonian world and, a, and an Einsteinian world, right? We, right. We, we all, you know, even once Einstein was like, hey, this world is, this universe is a lot weirder than you think it is. It's not like people stopped being able to function Mm -hmm. you know, in the world. Right? And I think this is a weird thing that people are like, oh, well, if I, you know, if I learn something from this 
indigenous epistemology, that means that I'm going to like have to renounce my, you know, my empiricist scientific worldview. Yeah. And it's no, no, you know, and this is evidenced by there's lots of really great indigenous scientists, you know, who still are, you know, cultural practitioners, right? We don't, and, and people are Catholics and they're scientists. Like we do this all the time. You yeah. right. We don't got to make a big deal of it. <laughs> um, uh, and so it's about, and one of the things I say is like, you know, um, you know, be inspired, don't appropriate. Don't be like, oh, that little bit of Blackfoot philosophy looks really tasty. I'm going to take it and I'm going to like, you, you like kind of use it as an explanation for what I'm doing. Right. But be, be inspired. Right. So if you go look at, you know, Leroy Little Bear and uh, Ryan Heavyhead's, uh, you know, conceptual anatomy of the Blackfoot world where they're talking about, um, they're talking about how the Blackfoot language sort of actually operates in a way that may be much more, much closer to quantum physics, right, than say English, right, mm -hmm. because it's all about flow, and it's all about forces, and it's not about everything is in movement all the time, every time, right, so it's not like, oh, let's like go learn, let's go like become Blackfoot believers, <laughs> right? Um, because first of all, you can't really, you're not Blackfoot, so sorry. Uh, <laughs> but, um, but be inspired by that, which is what, what, how I feel. Like for me, whenever I feel like I'm kind of settling back into kind of just the Newton Newtonian way of thinking about the world, like it's a bunch of solid objects interacting with each other. Um, I go and reread that essay and it's like, okay, that's right. There's such a different way of thinking about the world, you know, and it's really productive when I'm considering these kind of topics, you know, but it doesn't help me necessarily pick up this mug, right? So I'm going to keep remembering how I pick up this mug now. <laughs> I'm not going to like throw that away. Um, so that's my advice. I think that there's lots of, you know, like I said, there's Leo or Little Bear, there's um, there's a number of other indigenous philosophers, Vine Deloria Jr., um, that are really well worth uh, reading. Um, to 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 in the same way that we in the Western canon, we we already read different philosophers, right? So there's a reason why right, we read we read uh, Aristotle and we read Hegel, right? And we read Derrida. We don't, we're not like, oh, well, it's all from the same tradition. So they're all basically going the same thing, right? It's like, well, no, it's all within the same tradition. So there are some kind of limits that they never go past, but they're very different takes on that tradition. And it enriches us and it helps us think about the world in a more creative way and help us get further along to understanding what's going on instead of making all these really bad assumptions, you know, like, you know, there's the, there's the spirit world and then there's the yeah. physical world and they don't meet. Right. And I assume that you think art plays a very important huge, role in that. Yeah. Huge, huge. Like, you know, from, you know, for me, um, I, I don't see how you can do futures work without heavily involving artists, right? You need people who can like, can manifest imaginings in formats other than text, right? Text is great. Lots of great science fiction, <laughs> lots of great futures writing in text, you know, but that's not the only way to do it. And you miss things when you're sort of so focused on text. And the other thing is, is that you're not going to reach audiences other than academics, right? Or people in, in the industry and consultants. You're just not going to reach that. You're not going to reach, you're not going to reach, you know, my community. You're not going to reach, you know, my wife's community. You're not, you, those people, they're not going to read this stuff. And I don't blame them. You know, um, that's not a deficit. They got better things to do with their time. But if you put an illustration in front of them that's imagining their community 50 years from now, boy, they'll talk about that, right? If you make a video game, like with one of the one mid video games that we helped produce in Hawaii, that's imagining Hawaiians taking our amazing uh, astro navigation skills that came from transiting the Pacific Ocean, and sort of translated those into space, right? Um, and imagined sort of, you know, Hawaiians, Kanaka in space. Like, what is that like? And it's a game, you know, and there's cutscenes in it. So there's like little videos and stuff like that. They'll talk about that, right? 
They'll, they'll, yeah. they'll totally engage with that. And you can have that conversation about the future. Yeah. So, you know, for me, it's a big issue about what is the audience you want to reach, you know, and if you want to be serious, not everybody has to be, you know, not everybody has to work at community level. Um, um, I think some people for what they say that they're trying to do, they have to. And if they can't figure out ways to do that, then they're just making stuff up. Yeah. <laughs> doesn't matter how many times community appears in their bio or in their paper or something like that. But if they're not, if they're not there, if they're not, you know, doing workshops or helping teach their kids or learning the language or, you know, there's all kinds of different ways to get involved. And I'm not the super community person. I don't live with my community. I don't speak the language, right? I'm not, I'm, I, I don't want to sound, you know, self-righteous about it because I am in no position, you know, to be, to be righteous about those things. But I do think you have to make the effort um, if you're like, you know what, I, we, we're doing this work to change the lives of X, that you need to be grounded in X in a really substantial way. And art really, really helps. And then the other thing is that, again, in the indigenous cultures that I'm familiar with and my own, art is a form of knowledge production and dissemination, right? We didn't buy into this, you know, again, this Western Humboldtian way of organizing knowledge where art is this thing that happens over there and it's just about aesthetics, yes. right? But it's like, no, art is actually a way that you capture and translate knowledge, Yeah. right? And so with the work that we do with the indigenous community, art is central. It's probably yeah. the central, I mean, certainly for us, it's the central thing that we do. I would think that a number of the community members I know, they would agree with that. Some would not, you know, yeah. um, and it depends on how you define art as well. Yeah, you know, there are a couple of questions uh, kind of looking at this from different perspectives, but I'm going to sum it up. Is it possible to create ethical AI in a basically system, economic system that's extractive? So that is a great you, question. You need to change the larger system before. Yeah. It's so like, that's are, we, are we banging against something that? No, no. So that I'm really adamant about, okay. right? Nothing changes without a million small steps. Okay, you never overturn the system overnight, right? And if you do, you usually end up with a counter revolution and a bunch of people dying, okay? Like the real <laughs> change that gets fixed in place and is sustainable happens through a series of small steps done by thousands, tens of thousands of people, right? So it's not banging our head, right? If the, the thing that you're doing is going in the direction that you want it, you think things need to go, then that work is valuable and you can't get up. Give up. Part of the reason why I'm talking about this is that, you know, I've had some very challenging conversations with some of my students and my own child, my own children, about the events, you know, of the last year, right? Where particularly, you know, you know, students of color feeling very like just despair that things haven't changed. And what's the point of fighting? Because we still end up with somebody like Trump and we still end up with, you know, something like the George Floyd incident and stuff like that. And I'm like, yeah, that's, it's really, it's really shitty. And it's crazy that we're still dealing with this stuff. But the only way it changes is if we keep hope and we keep trying to do the work. So always keep trying to do the work. Um, the, the, the bigger thing, and again, see, I, you know, I, I, I get going, you get me going. And then I like forget what your question is. What was the question that made me go off on that? Possibility or impossibility of ethical right. AI yeah. in the interactive system. Yeah. So, um, so there's a one of the essays in the uh, indigenous um, indigenous protocol and AI position paper by Suzanne Kite, the PhD student uh, who works with me, is called "How to Build Anything Ethically." And what she does is she uses her people's Lakota people's protocol for building a sweat lodge, and then she imagines those steps of the protocol for building a computer, right? And those protocols, they go all the way back to how the materials are sourced, right? So you have, to, you have to source the materials for your sweat lodge in an ethical way in order to build an ethical sweat lodge. And then you have to, you have to um, transform them. I won't say dispose, right? But you have to transform them when you're done in an ethical way, right? So she uses this as, as a way to talk about how we have to look at the whole system from, from the material coming out of the ground 
to the material going back to the ground and sort of offers up Lakota, you know, uh, protocol as an inspiration for how to think about these things. So we have to fight on, and it's like, I forgot how many steps, but it's like 35 steps long, right? Like we have to fight at each one of those steps, right? And we have to confront each one of those steps because we're not going to get rid of capitalism overnight, right? We're not even going to get rid of extraction overnight, right? And, um, and we're, we're, you know, our whole conversation is benefiting from the fruits of extraction and capitalism, right? The technology that we're using. Um, and so we can't be like, well, we're not going to talk to each other, you know? So I, you know, I think it's, it's really encouraging those small projects, small and big, but you know, the big, smaller ones, it's easier to get discouraged, you know, that are pushing against these sorts of things. I think that, you know, the work that AI, the AI Now Institute is doing is friggin' fabulous. Right, they're like doing the research so you can really show how problematic these technologies are. Right, they're out there advocating for a different way of approaching these things. They're putting their friggin' time in their careers, like into pushing this conversation in the direction that uh, they think it should go, and I think it should go, and that's hugely commendable. Right, and there's other people who are doing that work, you know, that work as well. Genevieve Bell over in Australia, you know, like. Um, and I already mentioned, you know, Timnit and Joy, um, and we got to support them, you know, like we got to be there for them. We got to show up when they're being fired, <laughs> you know, we got to convince the people who have the money to give them the money instead of dropping like, you know, another hundred million dollars on friggin' MIT, you know, like take half that money, you know, if you really want to do something interesting with AI, take half that money and give it to places like AI now, Yeah, you know? Um, that's the sort of things that I feel like can help push is like, it's like, how do we make this the central problem, ethical AI, instead of the thing that gets tacked on after the engineers have figured things out, because the engineers are figuring things out badly. Yeah. That's what we know from all these problems with algorithmic bias and data bias, yeah. right? They're doing magical things, really incredible things, things I can't do, right? Um, but they're also building them in a bad way. Right. And um, and just sort of like slapping a you know some manifesto about AI ethics and responsibility on top of it afterwards isn't going to do it. Right. You know they need to fundamentally change the way they're doing it, and it's because you know, and it's like you know you know white and I've said this before in other talks why you know white supremacy is not just for people anymore. <laughs> right. We're building it into our technology, yep. um, and the okay. and. And when you get really cynical, you got to be like, oh, well, I guess that white supremacy is not a bug, but it's a feature. Right. These people are actually fine with it being there. Right. Why are they fine with it being there? Jason, I hate to do this, but I'm getting notes that we have to end. And I really hate doing this because I think we can at least spend another hour. Yeah, sorry. Like, you, you wind no, me up no, and I, no. me up and I just keep There's going. So much, so much learning for me personally, and I'm sure for others. And um, I can promise you one thing. We'll continue this and... Um, we're, we're going to put together some list of resources because I think a lot of people are interested. And just like you said, you started it and you learned about it. I think we're all need yeah. to be learning a lot and listening. Thank you so Great. much. I appreciate Thank it. You. Mahalo. Okay. Um, Aicha, anything you want to add? Yes, uh, please join us for our next webinar, um, February 22nd. It'll be with the things we did next, um, which is a collaborative practice that generates a series of interconnected artworks and projects based on collectively imagining multiple futures. So please join us for that. Um, and you can, I shared a link to register in the chat. Um, let me share it just one more time. Um, or I'll, we'll share it in the, um, the follow-up email um, as well. So thank you so much, Jason. Thank you, Marina. Um, we'll share links um, to more resources. Um, so please do stay in touch. Thank you so much for joining. <laughs>